Greetings, everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to come to you on behalf of the uh, Vascular Surgery Society of uh, Vascular Surgeons, Phlebologists, and Angiologists of Ukraine. It's a great pleasure to be asked to deliver this lecture. Here are my disclosures. And I'd like to begin by discussing the Caprini score, which is nothing more than a good history and physical. And the reason this score came about is thanks to a number of brilliant people from around the world who helped put this together with me. We know as the number of risk factors goes up, the incidence of venous thromboembolism increases. We also know that the power of each risk factor is important. Some risk factors are low power, such as bed rest and, and uh, hormones, but some risk factors are very high power, like cancer of the esophagus or of the stomach. So taking these powers and putting them together with the number of risk factors, we come up with an equation. And that is a simple score. And that score increases along with the incidence of venous thrombosis. Here we see the results in general surgery and as of today, there are 226 publications in over 5 million patients around the world that have used this score. The score was first proposed to be used by the Guidelines Committee of the Chess Consensus Conference in 2012. And they uh, concluded from the data that was present at that time that a score of five or more was associated with a 6% chance of venous thromboembolism. We know that that's not now true. And if we take a look now at the set point, and this is very important, the set point for various populations, we see that there are, uh, if, there, if we took a look at one, at, at the one, at the five figure plus uh, a five to six score, 1% in general surgery, less than 1% in head and neck surgery, and around one, a little over 1% in plastic surgery. But if you go over eight, Look at how those values jump, 6.5% in general surgery, 11% in plastic surgery, and 18% in head and neck surgery. Very important to know the set, pain in, set point in your population. Now, the good news about the Caprini score is that it takes a look at multiple factors. The bad news is that it's very hard to collect all that data. So we have decided, and again, look at all the people from around the world that have helped with this. Um, Patients like to be involved in their own health care. So we've come up with these patient-friendly assessment. And here it is, very simply. And there's two very important and powerful parts of this that are found nowhere else that, that I can see in risk scores. First is evaluating complications in women from obstetrical incidents, such as uh, unexplained stillborn infant, three or more spontaneous abortions, preeclampsia, baby born smaller than appropriate birth weight. These defects may be the clinical manifestations of a thrombophilia complex known as the antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. And we will discuss that a little more in a minute. Another very important and powerful part of this risk score is to talk about family history of thrombosis, which is also uh, unique to this score as well as the British Department of Health VTE risk assessment tool by the National Health Service in the United Kingdom. Using that tool in the United Kingdom, they were able to lower the death rate over two years. We have also seen some similar results with the Caprini score. Now let's come back to those obstetrical complications. Again, recurrent unplanned abortion, stillbirths, premature birth with toxemia, growth restricted infant, any of these patients with these historical events may be carriers of one or more of the following abnormalities, lupus anticoagulant, anticardiolipin antibodies, or beta-2 glycoproteins. Now, if uh, depending on the number, if one is abnormal, the risk is lower, two is higher, and three is the highest. So a person can carry these for life, even though they're past their, their uh, obstetrical uh, career. And it's very important to note these because this may be the difference between life and death in a very uh, touchy situation where without this, the balance between bleeding and thrombosis may or may not indicate anticoagulation. We also know that it's important to take a look at not only first degree relatives 
like siblings, sons and daughters and parents, but also maternal half siblings, uh, paternal half siblings, nieces and nephews. And don't forget grandparents and also third degree relatives. And there's even some association between people who live together. And that may be because they have similar lifestyles. Now using the Caprini score, the baseline score can be presented by the patient or family members to a healthcare provider. You know, at a time when injury requiring casting or immobilization occurs, developing the coronavirus, for example, admitted to the hospital for serious injury. And if that baseline score has already been in the record because the patients have done it previously, then it's very, very easy to keep track of all these factors during an emergency situation. And it's important that these patients be rescored during hospitalization because reoperation, infection, and central lines uh, can occur. Uh, uh, the, uh, a cancer can be picked up that wasn't present on admission. And so the updated score will often result in a change in thrombosis prophylaxis, including both post-discharge anticoagulant prophylaxis. So that this score is a dynamic instrument. Now, the problem with the score is not so much the score. The score pretty much indicates who's going to develop a DVT. But implementing the score is a problem. There's a disconnect between the evidence base and implementing that evidence base in the patients. And there are many reasons for that. But in order to reduce VTE deaths, pre mandatory implementation of appropriate care pathways are important. And here we see the results from Boston University. And they had a high incidence of venous thromboembolism. And after implementation of their program, look at how they got down to a very low, almost imperceptible level of VTE events at 30 days. How did they do this? Well, they had a mandatory risk assessment. And those with low molecular weight heparin uh, with a score of 5 to 8, they had to take low molecular weight heparin for 7 to 10 days, no matter if they went home or not. And the compliance was 89%. And remember, history has told us that in order to, be a, 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 to have a period of time that's efficacious for preventing venous thrombosis, it's seven to 10 days. It's not just during hospitalization. It's not until the patient gets up. It's seven to 10 days. Nobody in this audience would ever dream of using an antibiotic for one or two days for an infection, you would give the antibiotic for the period of time that's been shown in the literature to be associated with venous thromboembolism. Now, in addition to that, patients that had a score of over eight got 30 days of prophylaxis, again, no matter whether or not they went home. And the compliance for that was 77%. Now, how did they do that? Well, the insurance company, the hospital, and the drug companies got together and they decided that every patient that was qualified to receive this product would receive it regardless of their ability to pay. What a wonderful poster child for the nation. If everyone did that, just think of how we could lower the incidence of venous thromboembolism. Now, studies from around the world have revealed a high thrombotic risk for patients with escalating Caprini scores. And the data in patients with scores above eight suggests extended prophylaxis may reduce VTE events, thus help prevent fatal pulmonary emboli. Unfortunately, the ASH guidelines when they came out in 2019 chose not to address any of the Caprini score uh, articles, which at that time were over 150. Let's take a look at around the world what we see. Here we have a study from China, and this is in hospitalized patients comparing the PADO and the Caprini score. And let's look at the Caprini score. Look at how the rate of VTE escalates depending on whether the score it goes up five to six, seven to eight. Look what happens over eight, 24 fold. Again, if you take a look at the difference between the Caprini score and the Padua score, it's really not fair because if you add 40, ask 40 risk factors, you're going to get a higher percentage of, of uh, takes than if you just ask uh, a fewer risk factors. I'd like to point out this because this is a very important study that was done from the Republic of Vietnam in four Hanoi hospitals over a two-year period. Um, and they scored almost three million patients with a Caprini score in these four hospitals. And look at how when 
the incidence of venous thrombosis goes up depending upon the score. And my hat's off to the Vietnamese, as to the Chinese and all the others from around the world, and especially in Russia, we've got some very good data from Russia that show uh, the uh, incidence of venous thromboembolism related to the score. And here we go now to Moscow. And this was a study in which patients uh, had a duplex scan and, when, and with a five to eight score, one patient. Uh, the incidence of venous thrombosis jumped to a quarter of all those patients scanned if the score was nine to 11. And look what happened from 12 to 15, it went up to 65%. Now, I'm not saying that, that those numbers are high because one of the reasons is where they were using screening with duplex scanning, but nevertheless, the proportion is the same. The curve is the same. It's the same you see in Vietnam. It's the same you see in Boston. It's the same all over the world if the score is applied properly. Now, these Russians went a step further because they observed that in patients with a score of nine or more, the frequency of symptomatic events was 11%. And with it over 11, almost 60% of patients got a, a thrombosis despite stockings and low molecular weight heparin. So the authors postulated that this extremely high risk group requires improvements in their VTE prevention protocol. Escalating the low molecular weight heparin dose would be one option, but that would increase the bleeding. So they decided to add pneumatic compression. And so now we have two groups, 407 patients, <clears throat> excuse me, the control group was low molecular weight heparin with stockings and the compression group uh, was a combination of low molecular weight heparin stockings and of course, pneumatic compression. Blinded duplex scans, 12 hours postoperatively and every three to five days. Low molecular weight heparin was given for at least seven days or more in all patients. As we know, is the proper amount of time for uh, efficacy. And IPC was used for 18 hours a day. What are the results? In the study group, there was one breakthrough thrombosis. Whereas in the control group, which didn't include pneumatic compression, 34 breakthroughs, 16.7%. In addition to that, five of those patients in the control group developed PE and three of them died. No PE was seen in the study group and no statistically significant differences are observed regarding skin injury or bleeding incidents in this group. Now let's talk about COVID-19. This is a very serious, as you all know, and a terribly devastating disease for all of us all over the globe. It's a inflammatory illness, which is virus induced, which triggers cytokine storm, causing tissue factor release, thrombin generation, fibrin formation, ostensibly to coat the virus and prevent the spread. That's a brilliant idea, but unfortunately, this one of the side effects was thrombosis. And activation of thrombin causes hypercoagulability. For the first time, we're seeing large numbers of pulmonary thrombosis, in situ pulmonary thrombosis, in addition to the usual DVT, PE, stroke, or arterial thrombi in any location. Microthrombi in the, in, in the vessels of the vital organs can result in organ insufficiency. Fibrinolysis is triggered, which complicates this whole picture because that increases the bleeding problem and in some cases causes a consumption of uh, clotting factors with a DIC-like picture. Here is the beautiful alveolar endothelial interface in the lungs. And this COVID-19 virus has a predilection for attacking this particular area. And this virus you might think of as spikes that pierce the endothelium and they're facilitated by an ACE2 receptor. And this leads to pulmonary edema, activation of kinins causing capillary lesion, leakage and angioedema. In short, this alveolar membrane is no longer functional and it may be permanent. So this is a terrible amount of damage that could be done by this virus. Now I would like to step back in history and talk about what Oscar Ratnoff taught us 50 years ago. And he talked about four experiments that were done in the ahead of the 20th century that proved that contact activation could trigger multiple systems. And one example of that is that the, uh, the people in, in, in those early days when they did autopsies found that the blood that was in the vessel 
It didn't clot very fast at autopsy, but if it was in a rubber tube, it clotted a little faster. If you put it in a glass tube, it clotted really fast. Activation of clotting triggered this reaction. Nevertheless, what we see, and he, he uh, used John Hageman, who had a factor 12 deficiency, Oscar was studying, to show that the activation of factor 12 can cause platelets, coagulation, fibrinolysis, complement, and calocrine activation resulting in thrombosis, fibrinolysis, increased vascular permeability, vasodilatation, bradycardia, angioedema, histamine release, and hypotension. Now, some of those reactions from the uh, immunologic pathways were thought only to occur as a result of an antigen antibody reaction. But here we're saying, Air Oscar said, no, that's not true. In addition to that, contact activation can produce this same picture. And he also came up with something very important. And everybody that's studying COVID-19 needs to listen to what Oscar Ratnoff said. The thesis of my talk is not new. We think about clotting, fibrinolysis, immune reactions, and inflammation as if they were separate and separable processes. In truth, these distinctions are man-made. In real life, it is the body as a whole that responds to injury. The processes through which it defends itself are interlocked like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. We may be intrigued by the intricate pieces of this puzzle, but the picture emerges only we aren't when they are put together. So this is a call out to all of those immunologists, inflammatory doctors, virologists, clotters, and everybody to start getting together and pooling their information uh, to attack this disease. And I believe that now this is all beginning. And there's one thing we know for sure. Anticoagula anticoagulation alone is not the answer in this disease. Now, the American Society of Hematology produced guidelines uh, earlier this year recommending prophylactic anticoagulation intensity over intermediate or therapeutic intensity anticoagulation for prophylaxis in patients with COVID-19. Now, they recognize the need for high-quality randomized trials, which we're going to see in a minute. They also acknowledge that these were conditional recommendations and that risk assessment was something that needed to be looked at. Now, let's see what we have. The first thing we have is the NIH multi-platform that's now been published, and it showed very clearly in the population study that therapeutic anticoagulation was no benefit to patients who were in ICU, severely ill patients, and only increased their bleeding. Whereas compared to uh, uh, prophylactic doses, therapeutic doses on the other hand, for patients that were not in ICU, not that seriously ill, not on ventilators, therapeutic anticoagulation was superior to the usual care prophylactic dose anticoagulation in reducing the need for organ support and mortality in these patients. That's all well and good. There was no individual risk assessment done, like a Caprini score and improved score for that. Then along comes the ACTION trial, a beautiful trial done in South America with a number of investigators. And they showed that in patients hospitalized with COVID-19 and elevated D-dimer levels, initial therapeutic anticoagulation using rivaroxaban once a daily for stable patients or anoxaparin for unstable patients followed by rivaroxaban through 30 days later, did not improve clinical outcomes and increased bleeding compared with in-hospital prophylactic anticoagulation. So the first trial told us, use therapeutic anticoagulation if patients aren't seriously ill. This trial says just the opposite. Again, no individual risk assessment. Now, in my opinion, and I may be totally wrong about this, but I believe the lack of thorough individual patient risk assessment is one explanation for the disagreement regarding benefits of anticoagulation dosing in COVID-19 patients. And I'll show you some data later with a Caprini score to illustrate that point. And I firmly believe that it is not appropriate to put everybody in the same size shoe. It doesn't work well long-term. We knew this before COVID-19. Why in the world did we have to relearn it now? Now, before we get to that specific data, I would like to talk about a unique project that we have involving two high school students who were, who were asked to distribute the Caprini-friendly score to their classmates and friends to take home. 
And when they did that, naturally, uh, the family and friends, this was looked at homework. So they all tried very hard to, to provide and help them with their homework. So in a month, we got 1,219 responses. And family history of blood clots was documented in 22% in of these people. It's amazing. Never been able to collect that kind of data otherwise. Also, um, of note is that almost 60% of these people were less than 41 years of age. And uh, over a quarter of them had an elevated BMI, 10% hospitalized with infection, swollen legs, and almost 10% with insulin-dependent diabetes. So this is a powerful tool for obtaining complete risk assessment data. The student to family collaboration captures essential family events, including a history of thrombosis. They all huddle together and talk about their family history because they're trying to help the kids with the homework. But look at the beautiful side effect of that. Now, if those results are then taken by those people to their family physicians and the family physician can verify the data and put it in their record so that that data is always available. So now this onerous task of trying to collect the Caprini score during an emergency is, is, is obviated because the baseline data is already there. All that family history is already there. So it's easy to update the score. And here is a, an important thing to show that the Caprini scores of those who have a blood clot, family member with a blood clot, very high incidence. Now, average score versus age group. This is really something to pay close attention to because if the patients, if the people in the study were older than 75, their risk score at baseline without being sick was eight. So now let's talk about a study that was put together by two brilliant investigators, Alfonso Tafour from our institution and Alex Baropoulos from New York, the author of the improved score. And so we took the Caprini, they took the Caprini score and the improved score and looked at 184 patients. And they found that there was a linear increase in scores according to the risk level that was associated with both VTE events and death indicating that this was an important thing to do in COVID-19, individual risk assessment. We're now relearning what we knew before that we started with this pandemic. And I would just like to point out for the Caprini scores, because we have various grades here, that if you had a low risk, there was almost a no, inc there wasn't any incidence of, of DVT, and it was it went up to 5% with three to four. But look at that, it was almost 30% with a score of over nine. Remember that study with the patients of eight. <clears throat> now, what's even more compelling is those patients that had a low, a low risk, there was no mortality. With a score of three to four, the mortality was less than 10%. But look at the mortality for those with a score of nine and plus, 80%. So the, the patients that were in our survey with the students who had a baseline score of eight before they got COVID. If they got COVID, it would put them over the line to at least nine and maybe more if their D-dimer was positive. And that means they'd have an 80% mortality. Do you see how important individual risk assessment is in taking a look at these patients? And it's not just with the Caprini score. There's, uh, there's some really good data with the improved score, uh, including some later data which has just come out about post-discharge thrombosis, which is very compelling using the improved score in rivaroxaban. Now, in conclusion, I'd like to talk about another um, principle that I think is really key. Never kill a friend, never treat a stranger. This is not new with me. My friend from, from Maine, uh, uh, academic dentist, taught me this. Perform it says, well, when you, when you meet somebody, if you perform a thorough in history and physical, you now know enough about them like they were your friend. And so you would never treat a stranger. No, you would interrogate them and do a risk assessment. And you would never kill a friend. Of course you wouldn't kill a friend. And, and of course, nobody would be a stranger because you would do risk assessment in everyone. Now, ladies and gentlemen, are we treating most COVID-19 patients like strangers without individual risk assessment? It's a critical exercise, especially during COVID-19. So again, I'd like to thank the Ukrainians for the opportunity to present these data. And I wish you every success during this symposium and in the future. And I greatly look forward to being with all of you in person one day. 
and, and hope to see you soon. And everyone have a very, very fine day.